G'day YouTube, Warbles on a lot here with Australia's Day of National Shame, which is a book reading of uh, Darwin 1942, Australia's Darkest Hour by Timothy Hall. It's uh, based on the findings and the submissions to the Low Royal Commission into the surprise attack on Darwin on the 19th of February 1942. This is the second part of the chapter called The Brisbane Line which as we found out last night in the first part of the chapter was in fact the official strategy of the General Officer Commanding and the Chief of Staff of the Australian Army and uh, although in later years it's always been described as uh, a line running from just north of Brisbane to just north of Adelaide it's pretty clear by the War Office documents that from, uh, well, at least six months before the Japanese bombed Darwin and certainly four months before Japanese bombed Darwin, when Prime Minister Curtin was running Australia, the theory was the vital Melbourne to Brisbane line. And when Curtin came to power, he built a great big air base there at Tokumwal with the idea of servicing the aircraft that were fighting on the Melbourne to Brisbane line. So, for the second half of the chapter, I thought I might show you something a little bit daring. Starting here, we have number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44. Can anybody guess what these strange little shapes are what if what if I say that uh, if we go up a bit we find that Darwin is in area 319 These are actually the language boundaries of the 300, and, uh, sorry, the 500 tribes who lived on Australia before the doctrine of Terra Nullius took it into the Great British Empire. Last time Australia was actually invaded. before we started giving ourselves legends of how we defended ourselves from the Japanese when they were obviously going to invade us after they bombed Darwin. Anyway, let's get back to the chapter. Part 2 of the Brisbane Line. Taking up with a little bit of overlap on page 156. And rather than mark the map of Aboriginal dialect boundaries, We'll use an arrow shaft to stand in for the Brisbane-Melbourne line. The official war history confirms the belief of many strategists that Major General Blake's tactics were unsound. Whether or not the Brisbane line strategy was the cornerstone of the defence policy, he had more than 20 units deployed around the coast in the immediate area of Darwin and fixed defences of exactly 10 guns. The shortage of guns was not his fault, but his deployment of the units meant that he could only counter-attack if the Japanese were obliging enough to land in the area where they were positioned. It was far more likely that they would make their landing at Wyndham and come up behind the Australian lines, and if they did that, Blake had no defence to, to resist their attack. Men, aerodromes, the harbour, and indeed the whole military complex could have been taken without a shot being fired. Then when he moved his men out of Larrakia barracks and back to various camps in the bush, 
he inexplicably left his major supply depot in Darwin. Bracket, it was in Vesti's Meatworks. Close bracket. Vesti's a British pastoralist family that's had a long history of exploiting the Australian landscape and the Aborigines. So that whenever he needed supplies, he had to send his transport ahead of the fighting units. If the Japanese had made a frontal attack, they could have starved Blake's army into submission. Morale amongst the military men, that means army, was bad enough before the raid, with many of the troops restless and discontented after long periods of boring service in the enervating, that means makes you not want to do anything, tropical climate. Some units had been there for two years and almost to a man they hated it. Going, quote, tropo, unquote, which was a standing joke further south, was a very real problem and the incidence of psychiatric disorders was disturbingly high even before the Japanese attacked. The AIF men who were enlisted to serve anywhere in the world, Australian Imperial Forces, were frustrated that they had been banished to the Northern Territory when they wanted to be overseas, while the conscript militia who could only serve in Australia looked on a term in Darwin as being a form of punishment. For none of them was there anything to do by way of recreation. If Major General Blake had been an inspiring general, he would have found ways of alleviating the boredom. But as his critics suggested, had he been an inspiring general, he would not have been commanding the 7th Military District in the first place. To look for a scapegoat for the fiasco at the RAAF base was an unprofitable exercise. The station commander, Wing Commander Sturt Griffith, attracted most of the blame. But as Sherger and others were quick to point out, it was a system that it was the system that was as much at fault. If morale and comradeship among the soldiers at Larrakia Barracks had sunk to an all-time low, they had probably never even existed amongst most of the RAAF personnel. In one respect, Griffith was clearly not to blame. He had almost no control over the type of men who were sent to Darwin. Flight Lieutenant Colin Bell of Air Force Intelligence explained that the personnel section, which was based in Melbourne, made all the appointments, quote, and personnel regards every man as a number, unquote, said Bell. If they want a man to send to Darwin, they pick a number and send that number, even if he has just returned from the Antarctic. He might be a round peg in a square hole. Unquote. Personnel's philosophy seemed to be that if a man turned out to be a hopeless misfit, it was easier to shuffle a piece of paper and have him transferred to another station than to find out if he was likely to be unsuitable before he was posted. The station commander, meanwhile, not only had little or no control over whom he got, but found it extremely irksome and time-consuming to get rid of someone he didn't want. He had to make out a strong case in writing that a man was unsuitable and be prepared to argue it, and even then there was no certainty that the replacement would be any better. The usual consequence was that station commanders tended to put up with what they had and morale inevitably suffered. Group Captain Gerald Packer, the Air Intelligence Chief, apportioned the blame almost equally between Griffiths, whose action he described, quote, in military terms, very nearly criminal, unquote. And what he referred to disparagingly as, quote, that amorphous body that they call the air board, unquote. Amorphous means shapeless, by the way, for anyone who was wondering. Packer insisted that the responsibility for seeing that officers and men were given proper instruction in what to do in the event of a raid stopped abruptly with the station commander. Quote, and if he fails in this duty, said Packer heatedly, he is quite literally putting at risk the lives of his men, unquote. Packer reported to the Minister for Air, advising him, quote, with great regret that the Australian government cannot count on the morale of the RAAF under fire at the present moment, unquote. It was no wonder that his superior officers tried to send him to the wasteland of central China. Pretty sure that Minister for Air was killed in the crash of a Lockheed Hudson uh, near Canberra. They, uh, they got some very unpleasant stalling characteristics. And they take about 10,000 feet to pull out of a spin if you manage to stall them. A whole bunch of Australia's government and military brass were on it. Stall spin. Crash burn die. Uh, but there was good reason to question the reliability of the Australian Air Force. 
The ignominious flight at Darwin would have been worrying enough for the Air Board if it had been an isolated incident, but it was not. In Malaya, for example, at the aerodrome at Kuantan, an ambiguous order was given by the station commander, who happened to be an RAF officer, Royal Air Force, British, and the station was almost as rapidly abandoned by its RAF and RAAF stations as Darwin had been. And on that occasion, the Japanese were not even within hundreds of kilometres of them. There was a court-martial and the Australians were exonerated, but the fact that they ran away was not disputed. During the heavy fighting at Rabaul, when the Japanese were launching an attack, some of the Australian RAAF officers and ground staff had not stood firm in the face of enemy fire and had to be physically threatened to prevent them running into the bush and panicking a very large number of other men. It was calculated that 10% of the men at Rabaul were, quote, unreliable and that they had directly affected another 15%. On more than one occasion, this resulted in a quarter of all the men bolting almost before the unit came under attack. Again, at Koh Pang in Timor, some of the officers and men, instead of proceeding to the slit trenches when Japanese aircraft appeared, bolted for the nearest cover. It was neck and neck whether the officers or the men got there first. The inevitable conclusion is that Packer was right when he said that when an attack was made on men who had not been trained and who did not have effective, experienced and courageous officers, they were likely to break down exactly as they did at Darwin. The easy answer to the problem, or easy answer was that the problem was caused by the practice of promoting men on their technical competence and not on their ability to lead others. But at Samboang, for example, the same type of airmen with the same technical background behaved with great bravery, as did their officers. The difference was that they had been given repeated instructions on what they were to do in the event of an air raid, and they had a station commander who won and kept their confidence. Griffith's responses after the raid did little to dispel the criticism made by the Civil Defence Warden Edgar Harrison that, quote, The Army was most helpful, the Navy was most helpful, but the Air Force would not cooperate in any regard, in any way, to anything. Unquote. Three weeks after the raid, Griffith told Mr Justice Lowe that he had not been asked to give any assistance to the town as it struggled to clear up the devastation, and so he saw no reason to offer it. He had not even offered to loan medical supplies and officers to the civil hospital. What was more, Griffith said that he had not even made inquiries about the damage in the town and on the harbour, quote, although I believe there was some discussion about a low-level dive attack on the ships, unquote. He tried to explain this apparent indifference on the grounds that it, quote, was no particular concern of mine, unquote, but it did little to alter the conviction of most people who heard him that the RAAF could not be bothered to put itself out to help anyone in time of need. At the time of the raid, the senior air officer in Darwin, the officer commanding Northwest Area, Air Commodore Douglas Wilson, was not even in Darwin. On the 12th of February, he had gone to Java for discussions with ABDA. COM, the Allied Command representing General Wavell's American, British, Dutch and Australian forces. The RAAF in Northern Australia came under the operational command of ABDACOM, although for administrative purposes it remained under Australian control. Wilson had travelled without the authority of the Air Board, which he would normally have been expected to get, although he was technically acting within his authority in going. But whether he had authority or not did not alter the fact that it was a curious time to leave his command when every other officer in Darwin believed that a Japanese attack was imminent. He had been briefed by air intelligence along the same lines and it was no secret that events to the immediate north of Australia had deteriorated much faster than anyone had feared possible. In spite of this, he justified his absence on the grounds that at the time he left, he thought, quote, the possibility of an attack on Darwin was remote, unquote. The Royal Commission called this decision, quote, unduly optimistic, unquote, and the more forthright Captain Packer said it was, quote, absolute nonsense, unquote. On the day of the raid, Wilson was on his way back to Darwin from Java by, Java by way of Broome in Western Australia. 
He heard of the raid as soon as he landed at Broome, but in spite of his rank, he said that he was unable to find transport back to Darwin for another two days. At the beginning of the raid, the Territory's chief surveyor, Arthur Miller, had been chief warden, keeping the promise that the wardens had made among themselves that in an emergency they would not fail in their duty. But shortly after the evacuation train pulled out, a lieutenant representing Major General Blake had asked William White, Miller's subordinate in the survey department, to take over. Miller had shown progressively less interest in civil defence in the weeks before the raid, and he had also shown himself to be temperamentally unsuitable for the job when he was under stress. In separate incidents at Parap Railway Station, for example, when the evacuees were being loaded onto the train, he had slapped a Chinese woman hard across the face when she disobeyed his order to keep quiet, and had followed this with his instruction to a military policeman to, quote, put a live burst, unquote, with his machine gun at the feet of any unauthorised young man trying to board the train. Shortly after taking over from Miller, White had a visit from the administrator. Abbott, A-B-B-O-T-T, -T, told him that he was just leaving for Adelaide River and that the, the judge would be going as well. He told White that he was now in charge and gave him vague powers to write orders requisitioning food and clothing and immediately left town, saying that he would be back in a couple of days. White, who occupied only a comparatively junior position in the survey office, was left wondering what powers he did possess and how he could best use them. It also crossed his mind that this unwelcome promotion would probably ensure that he was the senior civil administrator when the Japanese marched into town. How brave of Abbott, eh? Just like Wilson. Didn't want to reinforce Darwin, it was supposed to be given up, eh? The police believed that the town was now under martial law and on Sergeant Bridgeland's instructions had thrown in the towel. Although individual officers continued to give selfless service to the homeless and the injured. In fact, martial law, which would have meant the suspension of the civil courts, was never proclaimed. Darwin came under military administration but never martial law. Judge Wells and the stipendiary magistrates continued to hear cases brought before the courts and even when Darwin was virtually a military garrison, there was always at least one civil policeman. In fact, for more than 18 months after April 1942, there was only one policeman, a constable called Lionel McFarland, who maintained his right of arrest even over service personnel charged with civil offences. He prosecuted, he wrote the court depositions and he gave evidence. He also had what was probably the unique distinction of being the only police constable to prosecute in an Australian Supreme Court, a task that he undertook on several occasions. Good on him. For the first two days after the raid, Gen Major General Blake failed to make any attempt to try and restore order in Darwin, even though it was self-evident that the civil control of the town had completely broken down and that there was widespread lawlessness. On the 21st of February, the situation was so bad that he was finally forced to assume control of the town, although he actually had no legal authority to do so until the 26th, when his powers were confirmed by national security regulations. Apart from ordering the Provost Corps into town immediately after the raid, which was itself the main cause of the breakdown of law and order, the first order made by Blake was to appoint a town major with wide powers to restore and maintain discipline in the town. But when the civilians, who had at first welcomed the news of the appointment, saw who had been given the job, they wondered what kind of contempt he held them in. For in place of the strong man who was desperately needed, they were given a tired and ineffectual elderly major who had been supervising labour gangs on the waterfront when the Japanese attacked. He proved to be entirely ineffective and he closed his eyes to the looting that was going on all around him so that it continued to flourish for weeks longer. White's biggest problem was, were the crews off the sunken and beached merchant ships who were impatiently waiting to be evacuated. They could not get out of town and most of them were living in tents near the hospital, an ordeal in the humid tropical wet of a territory summer. A few of the damaged ships were still capable of being worked and White, with the help of Naval Intelligence Officer Jim McManus, asked for volunteers to help get urgently needed supplies out of them. Almost all the men who were asked refused, 
claiming that they were shipwrecked seamen entitled to full pay at once without having to work for it and the right to be returned to their original port of signing on. They argued that one of the terms of the articles under which they had signed on was that they would not accept any other work or they would risk all their entitlements. Even in this emergency they were not prepared to do any other work. Those who did agree to work were offered a place in the Tulagi going south. She had been part of the convoy that had turned back but now she was beached and possibly damaged and nobody wanted to risk her or the uncertain fate of encountering more Japanese dive bombers on the slow journey around the coast to Perth. Major General Blake announced that if they did not go on board the Tulagi voluntarily, they would be made to, but he did not elaborate on how he intended to do this. The permanent ARP officer, Edgar Harrison, was playing a key role in trying to prepare the town for the next attack and was encountering a numbing apathy that stemmed from the belief that nothing could be done to save them. To save them. Harrison had an unfortunate manner that antagonised many people, and Judge Wells, who lavishly praised the work he did after the raid, described him as, quote, an overzealous officer who talks too much, unquote. The judge once remarked that the response to the ARP in the months when the wardens were trying to drum up some enthusiasm for civil defence in the town might have been much better if someone with a less abrasive personality than Harrison had been involved. Immediately after the raid, War Cabinet was impatient for information, but very little was getting through. Most of the early news came from people who had been in transit when the Japanese attacked and who had resumed their journey afterwards. The intelligence officers, whose function it was to pass all this information down to Canberra and Melbourne, stayed silent. Group Captain Packer had the task of preparing the intelligence briefings to War Cabinet through the three service heads, but he had almost nothing to work on. Two of the reports he made were later found to be wrong and had to be amended. He berated his intelligence officers in Darwin, telling them that their failure to dispatch proper information also represented, quote, a complete failure on your part as air intelligence officers, unquote. But the officers in Darwin were having problems of their own simply trying to collate the information. There were no logs in the RAAF operations room. Air Command headquarters said that they had never received a warning about the raid. There were a hundred conflicting stories about the ignominy of the officers and the men's behaviour after the raid, and the Americans were proving unwilling to help unravel the confusion surrounding the Kitty Hawks and the destruction of so many of them. Without an accurate story to send, the intelligence officers decided to brave the insults for as long as they could. Even weeks after the raid, there were still 1,300 civilians waiting to be evacuated, including an 85-year-old man who had been trying to get out of Darwin since the first boatload of evacuees had left on the Zealandia. In the following 18 months, Darwin was raided time and again, sometimes by a large force of Japanese aircraft, sometimes by a single Zero fighter. The invasion that everyone feared did not occur, and days and then weeks went by. But no sooner had people started to imagine that the danger was lessening, than the Japanese launched another attack. In all, Darwin was raided 64 times, and perhaps another 40 people died, although the records are incomplete. Japanese documents seized after the war showed that there were no plans for an invasion at that time, and that the bombing and strafing were intended as a more economical and efficient way of denying the Allies the use of Darwin as a launching ground for aircraft and possibly airborne troops destined for the Dutch East Indies. When the islands were all occupied and Australia had been isolated from America, they would invade in their own time and occupy Australia in a mopping up operation. Strangely, that's not actually what the Japanese war strategy was. It was to have a lightning war and negotiate a peace within six months when they had expanded their empire into a roughly rectangular shape. Running from the Aleutians down through Midway, they hoped to get into Fiji, across uh, New Guinea, to Timor, up across Indonesia. That was what they wanted, was a rectangular empire with secure borders and Japan at the centre of it. They didn't actually have any intention of invading Australia because they are going to sign a peace treaty from a position of strength. That didn't work out for them. The second raid 
did not come for two weeks and there was an eerie sensation that the Japanese were in some way just watching for the moment to strike. When the attack came, it came without warning as six zeros suddenly roared across the RAAF aerodrome almost at ground level, their machine guns blazing. Two men working on a telephone line were killed instantly and four others died. A Hudson loaded with bombs exploded. On the 31st of March, the Japanese flew their first night raid against Darwin. Sign they're seeing some opposition. Coming in on a clear moonlit night, but on that night the RAAF also received its first warning from the new radar team which was operating around the clock to service all the bases. There was a 20 minute warning and as a direct result there were no fatalities and no serious injuries. With experience and practice the anti-aircraft gunners were achieving much higher strikes and in one raid on the 4th of April, DCA, Department of Civil Aviation, radio operator Bruce Ackland was at his post on the Civil Aerodrome when seven bombers and their attendant fighters came over. Quote, the ACAC -ac came good, he wrote in his diary, and set five of the seven bombers on fire. One blew up in the air, another badly ablaze. Saw Jap jump out of one, just a small black dot. Then his chute opened and almost at once a burning piece of plane fell on it. He fell rapidly. Then the bombs began to whistle. They had jettisoned them over us and they were falling all about." Unquote. By mid-April, the first of the long-awaited fighters arrived and for the first time the Japanese could be challenged in the air. It was not always an even battle though, and inexperience often negated the value of having the aircraft. As late as the 2nd of May 1943, for example, nearly 15 months after the first raid, the Japanese made their 54th attack on Darwin using level bombers and Zero fighters. They dropped their bombs from about 8,500 feet or 25,000 8,500 metres, 25,000 feet, causing only slight damage to the RAAF aerodrome, and 32 Spitfires were immediately scrambled to intercept them. In the fight that followed, three Zeros were destroyed and five more were recorded as probable kills, but in the process no less than 14 Spitfires were shot down or forced to make emergency landings, and eight pilots were listed as missing. Speculation as to why the Australian losses were so high that day revolved largely around the assumption that the Japanese must have been flying ace army pilots as they occasionally did and that faulty maintenance had forced the other aircraft to make their unscheduled landings. But as a secret memorandum from the Department of Defence Coordination shortly afterwards reveals, bracket the final paragraph cautions, quote, the Prime Minister's instruction is that complete blanket censorship should be imposed, unquote, close bracket, at least five aircraft crashed because they ran out of fuel. Spitfires, northern Australia, huge distances, tiny weeny little ranges designed for defence of point locations in the Great British Isles. Five aircraft crashed because they ran out of fuel and the so-called engine failures suffered by the others were not the result of faulty maintenance, but of incompetent flying by the pilots. They simply did not have the experience or the knowledge to handle the Spitfires under combat conditions. By mid-April 1942, the Japanese had for the first time bombed and strafed the fuel tanks near Darwin Harbour, as though conceding that their immediate plans no longer included a landing on Australian soil. As though. Big supposition. Perhaps the aircraft assigned to bomb the fuel tanks got sidetracked into something else happening on the day of the first raid. During the attack on the tanks there was a huge flame and then an enormous cloud of dense smoke that rose thousands of metres into the sky as four million litres of oil exploded. Urged on by an impatient Royal Commissioner who hardly attempted to hide his anger at the lethargic speed at which the remaining civilians were being evacuated from Darwin, the Army finally completed its evacuation of all but essential personnel by the end of April. Darwin then became became a military enclave. Oh, that's the end of part 19. Next chapter is the Royal Commission. Orbels on a lot of YouTube. Ciao.